Simon. Hello. Hey, Simon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Simon. It's Skyler. Hey, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. What's up, Simon? Hello. Simon. How you doing? Hello. 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 Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hi. Conversations with storytellers. Wisdom. Folk and fairy tales from our elders. A meeting with professional storytellers. After the passing of some great storytellers, I decided I wanted to interview some of the elders in the community of traditional storytelling. I wanted to capture their thoughts, their ideas, and maybe ideals in their own voices. I didn't want a traditional interview, but a conversation with these folks. I was not looking for deep personal secrets, but for insights on what makes these legends in my world tick, what inspired them, what makes them do what they do and how they do it. Some will tell us their favourite stories. Others will share their thoughts on our profession. Some will give us glimpses of their lives and the lives of those around them, who their mentors and inspirations were or are. All of them share gems of wisdom. Welcome to Conversations with Storytellers. This interview lasted for the greater part of an afternoon at the National Storytelling Network conference back in July of 2016. It is the first interview that I recorded for this podcast. After editing it, it still lasts close to two hours, and so I've split it into two different episodes. Elizabeth Ellis is, in my mind, the godmother of storytelling. This interview, which was recorded when I first had the thought of doing interviews, actually began in the corridor as we chatted in the hotel at the NSN conference before I had my voice recorder on and we were both sitting comfortably. Elizabeth Ellis is a powerhouse of a person and a powerhouse of a storyteller. She is a supporter and cheerleader of other storytellers. I have a great deal of respect for Elizabeth and learn something from her every time we see each other or when I hear her speak. Make a cup of tea or coffee, get a drink and find somewhere comfortable, sit down and turn your devices off. Then enjoy the soft and ever youthful voice and the great wisdom of Elizabeth Ellis. So how long have you been telling stories for? For a living as a freelancer? Um, yeah, okay. Since 78. Okay. So you were right there at the very, very beginning. Well, they'd been there a little while before I got there, but not very long. Um, I, I'm not sure. Wh- I don't remember exactly what year the National Festival started, but seventy something. Uh, I was working at Dallas Public Library as a librarian, and really told a lot of stories while I worked at the library. It was a really good foundation for going out into the world, big world as a, as a freelance teller. Uh, because in those days, libraries valued storytelling very much, and we got formal training for it and all of that. Right. Um, in a way that doesn't really happen now. Um, so I had 10 years at Dallas Public while my ch- children were little mm-hmm. to... Um, kind of put the polish on story on storytelling for children. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in 78, Gail Ross and I went to the National Storytelling Festival together for the first time and uh, saw all these people who called themselves storytellers and said they made their living that way. And we decided on the way home in the car, we could do that, we could do that, we could do that. Do you remember who those tellers were that you saw up on the oh, stage? Oh, sure. Let's see. That year was Jackie Torrance and Donald Davis and Diane Wolkstein. The folk tellers. David Holt. was a woman who was an older woman who sang ballads and told stories. Sarah, someone, Sarah. Uh, 
She was there with a folklorist named Linda. Golly, their last names escape me. I could probably go home and find them, but at, right now that's the best I can do. Uh, and a woman named Harriet Allen, uh, an African American woman named Harriet Allen. Was it was it the general experience? Of oh, and and Catherine Wyndham. Catherine. Oh, right, right, right. How could I forget Catherine? Yeah, right. Catherine Wyndham. I think that's about everybody. Oh, the, oh, Doc McClung. Doc McClung. Uh, it, what was the question? Was there was there one? Was it the the general experience of of the festival that made you want to become a professional storyteller, or was it was it one or two of the performers that just really clicked with you and you you and Gail thought? I think I would it. say it was the general experience. Mm -hmm. We saw the folk tellers. And I think one of their great strengths was that what they did looked so accessible to people. Right. People went away going, we could do that. And Gail and I were among those people who went away saying, we could do that, you know. Uh, both of us had been really involved in storytelling one way or another and interested in it with a rather narrow focus. Mine being telling in the library and Gail had her Native American grandmother had lived with them when she was a little girl. And so she knew a number of stories that she had learned from her grandmother's telling. She had been involved in radio mostly uh, working mostly in radio at that point in time. So it was a different kind of storytelling. Right. Uh, but I, I really do not think that the, the people we were then, mm -hmm. I don't think we would either of us would ever have tried to do this alone. Right, okay. There was a real strength to having someone you could hold hands and jump off a cliff with, right. kind of like Butch and Sundance. Yeah. You know, the fall will probably kill you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't swim. Yeah. Let's do it the anyway. fall will probably kill you, yeah. you know, <laughs> as they're jumping. I don't know if you remember that scene yeah. in, the, in the film, but That's a great film. You know, the fall will probably kill us, but the people we were then, I don't think, would have done it alone. But we, but we could do it together. We were strong enough to do it together. Did you perform together? Oh yeah, we were a tandem team. Okay. Very intricately woven two voice stories. Uh, in, in a similar kind of way to Jennings and Ponder, Tim Jennings and Leanne Ponder. In a way, in a way, uh, a more intricacy than that. Yeah, they tend to they tend to overlap and overlay right. sounds and, exactly. and words. Yeah. Oh, sure. And it was powerful work. I enjoyed the str the the strength of the work kept us together long after being together made any sense. In those ancient days, there were not many opportunities for telling stories. You had to try to invent all of them as you went along. And in those places where there were storytelling opportunities, if they were gonna pay a storyteller a hundred dollars, if there were two of you, they might give you 125. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, um, it was really hard to make a living. I think of those as being the starving years, you know. Uh, we just, when I'm feeling clever, I say to people, yeah, Gail had a horse and I had children that all needed shoes. Mm -hmm. but, but eventually we had to, we lived about 270 miles apart. Wow. And, so, and we had made a promise on the way back in the car, mm -hmm. we will do this together. We promised we wouldn't do it alone either of us. 
which was so, I mean, looking back on it, it was so stupid. But at the time, it really made sense, and it was important at the time. But it meant that before any of us, either of us, could do any work, we, somebody needed to travel 270 miles right. and then get back home another 270 miles. And so it would have made far more sense if each of us had tried to make as much money telling solo as we could and told together whenever we had the opportunity, but we did not approach it that way at all. We uh, really stuck it out only telling in tandem and as the 12 Moon Storytellers. That was the name? Yeah. 12 Moon Storytellers, nice. And then we stopped working together after about five years. Was, was and, that because of the because you were strong enough tellers to work, or you you were confident enough to work on your own at that point? No, it was because we saw that we couldn't possibly make a financial go of what we were doing. Right. Five years—that's you know, a long time to find. Yeah, we didn't give up easy on the idea of of telling together. Yeah. Like I said, we we well, I thought what we did was so strong that. I didn't want to give that up, even when it didn't make any sense to try to continue it. So we kept at it for far longer than made a bit of sense. There was a period there where my kids and I were sleeping under somebody's dining room table, you know, Tommy Tatum's house under his dining room table. Wow. I had lost a house and had lost, you know, all of my savings was gone. and. A day just came when you know, I had to feed my kids the best way I could, and uh, we just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, so did, was there a point in that, towards the end of that five years, where you started to perform so, solo as well as doing the tandem stuff? Yeah. Okay. And as soon as we didn't work together, I discovered very quickly that I was the unwanted half of the 12 Moon Storytellers. How did you mean? Well, people were interested in and fascinated by Gail and her Native American heritage. Oh. And so of the two of us, she was the teller that people really wanted to hear. Huh. And it was really, really hard for me to try to jumpstart a solo career huh. because I don't really think that anybody could see the focus of my work. People didn't really see, the, I, I guess I'd say it that way, maybe. It was hard for people to see the focus of my work. And what was the focus of your work? Well, at that point in time, mostly Appalachian story, Appalachian t folk tales, mm -hmm. the kinds of stories I'd grown up with. I was interested in telling personal stories, but Gail was so adamantly opposed to doing that that I rarely, if ever, got to tell a story about my own life. And uh, once the two of us were working as solo storytellers, that was a part that I began to work on and try to build up, because it was something I'd kind of been holding back on. Uh, when Gail and I worked together, we had our set roles that we were supposed to live, be, I don't know what to say, uh, fulfill. Act, act, fulfill, that's the word I want, fulfill. Uh, Gail wanted to tell deep and meaningful Indian legends, mm -hmm. and so my job was to be Appalachian Annie, you know, uh, funny, funny stuff that would make people, that would help people be ready to hear something that was deeper and more metaphorical. Right. Um, I used to, we used to refer to one another alone and sometimes even in, on stage as Appalachian Annie and her faithful Indian sidekick running dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Our alter ego. Yeah, right. So because we had those very distinct roles, mm -hmm. I had to learn to do everything that Gail had done. And Gail had to learn to do everything that I had done. And mm. that was hard work. Mm. Because at that point in time, it wasn't in either of our natures to fill up the other half. Right. You know, uh, I, I had 
to really stretch and grow as a teller. And, I, and I'm sure if she were here, she would say it was the same for her. She had to try to learn to be funny. She had to try to learn to be witty and entice people and coax them into the story and all the all the stuff that had been be a bit more playful. Yeah, because yeah, uh, when we were together as as tellers, I discovered very early on if Gil was the first teller the evening didn't go very well, or not as well as it might have. But if I was the first teller, things went better. And I was not arrogant enough to think that I was a better teller than she was. So I had to look carefully at what was really going on. And what I observed was, people would, let's say, park their cars in the library parking lot and come in for the evening concert. I'm just making this yeah. up, but you get the idea. Yeah. Sit down in the seats, and the first thing they heard, Gail steps to the microphone and she says, there was once a woman who married a bear. And a lot of people you could see on their faces that they were going, oh, shh, wish I hadn't come to this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is... but if they heard a funny story first, Maybe another story that wasn't quite so funny, and then maybe a ghost story, and then they heard there was once a woman who married a bear. Their response was, my niece Sylvia did that. This right. is not going to end well. Uh. Because it started, stopped thinking literally and started thinking in metaphor. Yeah. But here in America, people can't just close the door behind them right, they can't hop on board. and yeah. hop on board that fa yeah hopping yeah. on board is a perfect ex a perfect expression of some big meta <clears throat> metaphysical or no metaphorical statement right. they need time to settle in and settle down and relax and open their mind to story but after they've heard two or three stories to help set that tone, right. they'll go with you almost anywhere if you have built it right to make it easy for them to do. So, so is this when you discovered your aha? Aha, aha, ah, amen. Yeah. It's the way I what I brought to Gail to help us plan sets right. and to think about what we were going to tell. When I said we didn't tell alone, I mean. As the Twelve Moon storytellers, often we would open with a story told in tandem, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then each of us might tell one alone, close with a story in tandem, that kind of thing. I don't mean that none of neither of us ever told a story by ourselves, right, I mean, right. uh, solo, but rather that we didn't tell. To, we, we didn't book separate programs right, right. apart from one another at that point in time, um, and. Yeah, the, it was just a way to help. Laura Nimi, uh, who we spent a lot of time with back in those early days uh, in Minneapolis, used to say that it was more interesting to hear us plan a set than it was to attend the telling that accompanied that, <laughs> yeah, because we, it invariably included at least one argument. Uh, and neither one of us are people who give in easily. Uh, so... <laughs> He used to love to watch us argue and uh, snipe at one another while we were trying to get ready, while we were trying to f put together whatever we were going to tell. Oh, dear. So how did you meet Lauren? We went to Indianapolis, I mean, uh, Minneapolis, to tell at a coffee house called the Coffee House Extempore, which was on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Lauren came to hear us, and we went out to a coffee shop and spent hours and hours and hours talking about storytelling. And uh, just made a good, strong connection. So we would spend a number, we spent a lot of time working in Minneapolis and a lot of time talking with Lauren in diners because that's his place of choice, usually, is diner. Yeah. Uh, so 
I have drunk a lot of coffee in his presence and we didn't know many people you could talk storytelling with. Mm. You know, uh, that was rare. We were... So driving half a day to meet up with somebody wasn't unusual? No, I mean, you heard somebody call themselves a storyteller, you'd drive 300 miles out of your way to meet <laughs> them, you know, yeah. and, and be delighted that you found one another. Right. Because, I mean, the storytelling community as it exists now didn't exist. It's not that there were not people who told stories. Right, it's right. that we didn't know one another and we had no way of knowing each other. We The internet didn't exist. Right. There was nothing cohesive to bring us all together. So the National Festival and if, a little later the National Conference, although that wasn't what it was called back in those days, uh, when they had it at the old co at Washington on the campus at Washington College Academy down there in Tennessee, um, the meeting up with other people mm -hmm. and the being with people who had the same passion you did and who spoke the same language and who didn't think you were strange mm -hmm. was so appealing. You know, you would just break your neck. Uh, to go to any kind of event where you where it was a gathering of tellers because because it was kindred spirits because, right because yeah. it was yeah uh, somebody stood up in the other room and said I found my tribe did you hear yeah, that lady yes, I found yes. my tribe um, I remember the day that we met Janine Bassini Beekman she was living in Houston. And we had heard of her so many times. And we got the chance to go to Houston to do a gig. We looked her up in the phone book. We called her on the phone. She invited us to her house. You know, was, uh, I mean, it was just so joyous yeah. to be with other people who were like-minded. Uh, we lived in, Gil lived 270 miles south of me or thereabouts, down near San Antonio. So she'd drive 270 miles to be to get to my house, and then we drove to St. Louis because the folk tillers were coming to St. Louis. Yeah. Put all our money together and bought a jar of peanut butter and a loaf of bread and <laughs> drove my old Volkswagen bus from Dallas to St. to St. Louis, Missouri, which is about 700 miles, yeah, I right. think, yeah. because storytellers were coming that close to where we lived. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for people now in the storytelling renaissance to understand how few of us there were and how much we meant to one another. Right. Yeah. And it was... A group of people who, well, a group of people who supported one another and who had one another's backs. Do you think it's changed much since then? Some, but not all that much. I think that the, I think that that, the early days set a tone for what would ha for what would develop mm -hmm. and what would happen, I was at an event a few years back, and a couple of the cowboy poet types who will remain nameless really took advantage of the situation in which they found themselves and hung the younger, less experienced storytellers out to dry. and broke their hearts. And my response to that was to speak to those guys face to face and I said, I'm going to assume that you don't understand what the rules are. So I'll explain them to you. In this community, we act like the rangers, not the 
baseball team, the Army guys. Mm. Whenever we are together to do something, we're all going in together, we're all coming home together. We carry our wounded out as we come. We leave no bodies behind. We have everybody's back. If somebody is ill or upset or having family problems, we circle the wagons around them and we protect them and make sure they don't get hung out to dry so that nobody in the seats knows that there's any problem at all. Mm -hmm. We protect one another and we take care of our own. And if you don't want to play by those rules, don't come to our sandbox because we don't go to your sandbox and make a mess out of whatever the rules are in Cowboy Poet Land. Yeah. Um, and there was a whole lot of shuffling the boots in the carpet. Oh, shucky darn ma'am, we did a meeting. And I said, don't try to pull that stuff on me. I raised two generations of boys. I know what that looks like. Yeah, You knew exactly what you were doing, so you ought to fess up to it. You owe those people the apology, and you ought to go and give it to them. I don't know if they ever did, but yeah. I said, from now on, for the rest of my life, by my phone, there's a list of people I don't work with. And yeah. your names are on that list. And any time somebody calls and asks if I'm available, I'll say, who else are you having? And if your names come up, I'll say, I'm sorry, I can't come. I don't work with those people. And if they ask me why, I'll tell them. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Well, sorry, too little, too late. You should have thought of that earlier. Yeah. Did you think there wouldn't be any consequences? Yes, yeah, right. To hold it. These younger tellers, less experienced tellers, live in this area. And to be invited to this event as featured tellers meant the world and all to them. Mm -hmm. And they have worked for months to get ready for this, and they are as excited as a human being could have been about being able to do this and to tell with you. And all of that turned to sand in their mouths. And they don't deserve that. Yeah. yeah they don't deserve that. They never did anything to you to deserve to be treated that way. Right. Yeah. We didn't mean for it to turn out like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I believe that you wanted your own way. Right. And I believe that you didn't think about the consequences of your behavior. That it never ma that you, you never gave a thought mm -hmm. to what would happen if you did what you wanted to do. Uh, and, I, and I truly believe that that's the truth. That they never gave a thought to anybody other than what they wanted themselves. Yeah. That's too bad. Um. You know, we, we police our own community. If people don't know the rules, the older members of the community to try to teach the rules to the younger people. You know? mm -hmm. This is inappropriate. It's not a great idea to tell somebody else's personal story or whatever, you know, yeah. whatever the situation is. Right, right. You wish you didn't have to say those kinds of things, but sometimes for the for the sake of everyone in the community, mm -hmm. one of the things we have to do, and I accept this, every time there's a new generation of tellers, they need to be taught what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, just like the young people in a family. Yeah. You know, somebody has to teach them manners. Right. Somebody has to teach them morals. Right. Otherwise, we end up with a community that ends up hurting itself and getting uh, pulled apart, right. pulled apart. When a few simple instructions, I know you really love that story, but the reason you can't tell it is because it isn't your story to tell. Yeah. You know, I wanted to stick my head in downstairs just long enough to see if the Native American melody and the Native American rhythm I was hearing was coming from a Native American. Because if it wasn't, mm -hmm. it probably meant that somebody needed to talk to that person, uh, that teller, about what was appropriate for them to be presenting. Right. You know? So I was relieved to hear that, to see that it was obviously a Native American teller who was making the presentation. Okay, no problem. Right. But for all I knew, it could have been. Me. Joe Blow from Kokomo, who's as white as the given <laughs> snow and doesn't know anything about 
the culture, yeah. you know, there are always going to people be people who don't know that they shouldn't appropriate someone else's culture. Right. And, and so if no one tells them, it's not their fault. Right. You know, we have to educate people and let them know that. You know, there's some ish, ethical issues that deal with, or there are copyright issues. I still remember a woman who came to the storytelling festival a few years back. Young woman, pretty woman, stood up and told a picture book and then sat down. And Catherine Wyndham was the MC and she came to the microphone and she said, that was lovely. Wherever did you get it? Mm -hmm. And the girl stood up in the teller bullpen, mm -hmm. red as a beat in the face, and stuttered out the name of the author because she hadn't credited it. Because Catherine knew it was yeah. a literary story that had not been credited. And Catherine wasn't rude to her. Yeah. Catherine was giving her a chance to redeem herself. Right. You know, if best. she had said, I don't know, I really am not quite sure what Catherine would have said next, right. but yeah, it was a lovely story, dear. Wherever did you get it? Gave the girl, the young woman, a chance to say the author is and say the name. You know, it was a little policing of the right. of the people in the community. Yeah. That's not appropriate. I bet you a dollar that young woman will never forget to cite her source for a literary story again in her lifetime right. after right. that experience. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. do literary stories just because of that. Um, I, I, I did yeah. one once. Oh, I was given a, uh, it was like a PDF or something. Or some, somebody had typed the story out and said, you should tell this story. And um, I learned it and I told it once. And then I was like, where did you get the story from? Because it didn't feel like a regular folk tale. And it turns out it was some story, I think, I'm not sure if it was Susan Cooper or not, but I can't remember who it was. Never told the story again. Yeah. Because it was a literary story. And it's like, you know, there's well, so many could, folk yeah. tales out there. You could have, yeah, but, yeah, you could have, I've been teaching at East Tennessee State, uh -huh. teaching summer school. It's hard sometimes to help the students, even though they're in the master's degree program at East Tennessee State, understand the concept of intellectual property. Right. This belongs to somebody, and just because you want it doesn't mean you get to take it. Right. You know, you need to ask their permission in the same way you'd want them to ask your permission if you were the person who created it. Right. You know, right. Uh, this is a circle. Yeah, it you're is. Going to put it out. You're going to. It's going to come back to you. You know. So. Uh, so you you were told a lot of Appalachian tales when you were growing up. Yes, a lot, of a, lot. a lot of Appalachian stories. My grandfather was a circuit riding preacher. Nice. Not the kind of minister that has one church, but yeah. rather the kind of man who rode through the mountains. Maybe he'd have 14, 16 churches that he was pastoring in a month's time. Wow. And so he had a, a regular circuit mm -hmm. of people knew the day of the the week and the day that he would come back again right. you know so he would be at each one of those churches about once a month and he came into those little tiny communities back in the days when there were very few roads in the mountains and people lived fairly isolated lives because travel was pretty hard and he'd do the marrying and the burying and the preaching and at the end of the day he'd go home with some family from the church and spend the night because right. it was too far to ride back home and there weren't any hotels or motels so right. some family from the church would give him the hospitality of their home and that meant he was a guest in hundreds of people's homes before the days of radio and television wow. so he'd come to your house save you the news He'd, be, he'd, be, the new, he'd yeah. be the news presenter, the anchor man, the weather man, <laughs> uh, the news commentator, but Sports. especially he would be the storyteller. Yeah. He, would, he, he would hear everything that you told at your house right. and then go down the road to Lee Rose, and in Lee Rose, whatever family he spent the night with, he'd tell them what he heard at your house. And he'd take the stories he heard from them and 
come to Boonville and tell those in Boonville or on, up on the head of Indian Creek or whatever, wherever he was in the circle, mm -hmm. anybody who was new to the community and knew some new stories was immensely popular immediately. Everybody wanted to hear what you had to tell. What did you know they didn't know? Yeah. So um, he knew a lot, a lot of stories, hundreds of stories yeah. that he had learned, he had collected, but by collected I mean all in his mind, right. um, through the years that he had been riding the circuit through the mountains. Uh, he knew stories that came from families that were English background or Scottish background or German background or, uh, you know, there were not very many African Americans uh, uh, in the mountains. There wasn't slavery there, right. and there was never enough money to attract anybody to come there right. until the coal mines came on. When the coal mines came on, there were some African Americans who came to work in the coal mines. But in his journals, he writes down. So there are journals of this? Yes. Oh, he wow. kept a journal for every. Those old ledger books. Yeah. that were really meant for figures. Mm -hmm. They were tall, rectangular books. They were gray, and they had uh, burgundy-colored corners on the, on the four corners of the book. Right. And he would write on the lines. I don't know why he didn't, uh, but he, they were all pretty much alike. He never bought any other kind of book, that's what right. I'm trying to say. And so he just, although there were columns, he just wrote oh, straight right. across. And so there are entries. And he wrote what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, marriages, baptisms, mm -hmm. funerals, people who uh, joined the church, all of that kind of stuff, so what, what, and at the end, at the and the from some people's point of view, the best thing about it is he wrote down everybody's full name and the day that they were born, if they knew the date that they were born in the mountains a long time ago. People didn't pay much attention to that, yeah. but if they knew when they were born, uh, he wrote that down. And sometimes their parents' names are written. So on a lot of levels, it's, an, it's a genealogical gold mine. Right. Uh, and will end up eventually in the Kentucky Historical Society's hands. But for right now, I'm still too much in love with it to yeah. give it up. Because yeah. you look through these, and you get a picture of his life. And at the bottom of each of the entries, there are li there's a little code he used. And it took me a really long time to figure out what that was. But finally, in one, I found a long slip of paper, long narrow strip of paper mm -hmm. that he was filling out to send to the presbytery. He was a Presbyterian minister, so to send him to the presbytery. Mm -hmm. And I guess he must have made a mistake or something. He didn't send that one. Maybe he corrected the ne made the next one correctly and sent it in. But I figured out, looking at this form, that those little code things that I'd been looking at and trying to puzzle out were how many miles he'd written on horseback, how many miles he rode on the train once the trains arrived in mm -hmm. in the mountains, how ma eventually how many miles he would he had driven by car although someone else, always, he never learned to drive, but people would come and get him, or my mother would take him, or later when I was older, I would drive him a lot. Um, so, though he was getting a little sum of money for every mile that he traveled, and he was turning in these reports so that they would send him these checks for, you know, $2.50 or whatever, because that was still a lot of money to him yeah. to, uh, compensate him for his traveling expenses and uh, but it took me a long time to, to to piece together what that what those things really meant yeah so he was a big matchmaker oh he was great matchmaker he was e harmony before there was e harmony <laughs> because these little communities were so small 
So the east of Ellis, I take it. What now? To the east of Ellis. <laughs> they have. Is, he was Gabbard. These are, this is my mother's father that I'm talking about. My mom's dad. Um, little tiny settlement, little community, mostly mm-hmm. rural people. But there's a young woman, and she would really like to get married. But she's related by blood to nearly everybody in the community one way or another. Right. And the one she's not related to, she probably wouldn't want to be married to. Right. So she might talk, tell my grandfather might ask her if she was interested in getting married. Or she would mention it, she would bring it up. Yeah. Or her father might bring it up. Yeah. And he'd go down the road on his travels, on his horse, Old Walker, and go... Uh, that was the horse's name, Old Walker? Yes. Over the years, he had a succession of horses. They were all called Old Walker. I do not know why, but when one got too old, he would retire that one and buy another one called Old Walker. Well, it makes it easy to remember. I, I don't know why. <laughs> but so he, um, He'd take that in his head and think about it. And down the road, 20 miles, or some other community, He'd see some guy that he thought was that was single that he thought was a man of good character, and he'd tell him about that girl in the other community in the days when people really didn't travel very much, you know. And he'd encourage the guy to write her a letter, and sometimes he'd be the one who delivered it as he went back through, and often he'd be the person who read the letter to the girl because she might not know how to read. In those days late 1800s, mm-hmm. a lot of the old people didn't educate their daughters. They didn't want their daughters to go to school. You know, it was If you educate a girl, you ruin her. She won't be fit for anything. You know, you wanna, because knowledge is power. Yeah, yeah, they'd send the boys to school, but they didn't want to send the girls. And so he wow. might be the person who read her the letter and help her write a letter back to the, if she was interested, write a letter back to him. And after certain amount of letter writing went on, the guy would write and ask if he could come and visit, and ask her parents if he could come and visit. And if that went well, then usually pretty soon after that, they'd get married. And he was never happier than when he managed to really make a good match, if he, if he thought he made a good match. So these journals, so you know, you could be reading along and I'll, choose something dramatic because it is my nature okay Okay, yeah this page says married thomas brandenburg to molly isaacs today i told elizabeth this would work this is his wife my grandmother okay i told elizabeth this would work he's obviously proud of this match we turn the page buried the williams girls today Martha, age 14, Mary, age 12, Sharon, age 10, Teresa, age 8, Cherry, age 5, and the baby, no name given, the the baby. And under that, all those names, there's one word in his spidery handwriting, influenza. And at the end of the word, the ink is splattered. And I can't help but think that that was a tear that fell on the page that splattered the ink. Because I don't care how much you believe in the hereafter and heaven and the pearly gates. Mm. How could you possibly bury all the children in a family in one day yeah. and not be moved to tears? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the, it is the book from, 18, from 1918. So the, how did he retire? The, pand- the pandemic. Did he retire? Or did he just... Oh, no, he was still doing all of this when I was a little kid, you know. Yeah. He was still going out and preaching when I was old enough to drive and take him where he wanted to, where he needed to go. So he did it but until his death? Pretty close, pretty, much. pretty close. He, I mean, in oh. his late 80s, he became bedridden. Okay. And, uh, and what year was that? Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to say maybe about 1965. He died in 67. Right. I think uh, the last couple of years, he, yeah, my mother cared for him. and he, My grandmother had already died a couple of years before that, but he became 
more and more withdrawn from what was going on around him and was in bed pretty much all day every day. My mother would get him up to go to the bathroom. And my uncle would come every day and shave him. He never lost touch with who he wanted to be. He always wanted my mother to dress him in a clean white shirt and put on his tie, you know, as though he was going somewhere to work, to, to be with people. Uh, he didn't want to, if it was daytime, he didn't want to lay in the bed in his pajamas. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So my mother would take off his pajama top and keep his dignity. put on his right. white shirt and his tie. And my, my Uncle Mike would come and shave him every day for my mom. He would sit in the bed, and for a while at first he read the Bible still some, and he would talk some. You could hear him praying a lot, out loud. And the praying aloud went on even after the words became indistinguishable. When I'm near the point of his death, he really couldn't understand much of what he was saying. It was, he was so feeble, just, you know, mouthing words and making the sounds. I used to put my mouth, my ear right down next to his mouth to see if I could understand. There would usually be, you know, some, a, a, an occasional, uh, oh, this is the Lord's Prayer, or this is the 23rd Psalm, enough that you could come. But if you right. stood beside the bed, you wouldn't have been able to understand that much of it. I put my my ear right down next to his lips practically to try to hear what he was saying, try to understand what he was saying. So was anybody else in the family telling stories? Any of the matriarchs? My aunt was a wonderful storyteller. Yeah. My grandfather, this man's mother, came from Ireland. So he had the gift of gab from her, and that was what they called it. If you were a teller, the, you, you were a person that had the gift of gab. Um, my Aunt Ida told stories that she heard from her grandmother and stories she had heard in the community. She kept a lot of the old fairy tales. Uh, my grandfather was drawn to different kinds of stories. I think men and women are often drawn to yeah. different kinds of stories. Uh, he told a lot of hunting and fishing yarns and tall tales and what I now know are called, is it the mar Marchin? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mirman Marchin. Yeah. The Appalachian versions of those stories. A lot of Jack tales. Often in Appalachia, Jack is called Little Nippy. Oh, really? But they're the same tales. Right. It just has a different name than down south, further south in North Carolina. So is um, Nippy like Nippa? In a P P Y nippy, little nippy. Yeah. Most of the stories like that, my grandfather told us though, they happened to him. <laughs> and I fell for it for years and years and years. I'd hate to have to admit to how old I was when I finally realized that couldn't have happened. Not yeah. In all those old traditional stories, Jack has two brothers, mm -hmm. Will and Tom. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was close to him two of his brothers, Stephen and Taylor, and so they were stories about Stephen and Taylor, and my grandfather, whose name was Isaac, and what, I'd go, you know, about the time I turned maybe 10 or so, I started going, no, but it still took me several months before I'd go, wait a minute now, I mean, say it out loud, yeah. wait a minute, that didn't really happen. Well, how do you know you weren't there, was always his response. And he made up a lot of stories. He made up a huge number of stories when we were little. And one of the things I think that's really remarkable looking back on that experience, I had 12 first cousins, his grandchildren. Wow. You know, there were yeah. 12 of us from all of his children. We spent time with him. I, m me more than they did, but we were together. We knew one another. We were close. We you know, played together, spent time together. In the evening, he would tell stories, and he made up stories, and you knew how he felt about what you had done that day by what kind of status he gave you in the story that he told. Wow. If he didn't think you had done your chores, or if you hadn't worked hard enough, or if you had gone missing and were found later, 
reading a book and daydreaming. <laughs> uh, we did that a lot. Everybody else got beautiful horses described in amazing details on this journey that was being made, and you ended up with an old sway back nag, you know, that was blind in one eye. I mean, you wanted his approval so much. I remember, literally remember bursting into tears because I was being punished by the story that was being told. You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember being about seven or eight years old and I don't remember what I'd done, but he obviously didn't like it. And so all the trappings I was given and the clothes I was given to wear and all of that in the story were just so much worse than what was given to my cousins. I was in tears. Uh, we would literally break our backs to work to do whatever he wanted us to do because we wanted him to say great things about us in the stories and how we were the heroes and what right. we did that was so magnificent and so amazing. It, it, it was, I, I have never talked to anybody whose childhood was quite like that, right. where the stories were telling, were a, a, were a vehicle for showing the approval of the, the adult. You know, yeah. uh, I like that. That's, that's an interesting parenting technique. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. It certainly is. I'm not sure if it work nowadays. Then, I'm yeah. not sure, but we we were yeah. you know we just it was a different time and place. We had we had hard physical work to do. You yeah. know, we had to hoe in the garden, hoe in the fields, chop weeds. So do you, do you know most of those stories? Still? I remember some of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and fragments of others. Yeah. Yeah. He was the kind of person who should have been recorded for the Library of Congress. Right. But when I was a young person, I wasn't smart enough to put we, all that together to think about that. I mean, he, he, died, yeah. he died. But the, I was, I remember the sort of discovery moment about, I'm going to say five or six years after his death, when one day I went, that was truly remarkable. Right. He was a really remarkable person, and I didn't really, I, I took that for granted, I, took, I didn't take it seriously. And think of everything that died when he died. Right. You know, uh, you, I'm sure you have heard the expression that when a storyteller dies, it's like a library has burned to the ground. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, that was very true for him and for Aunt, Aunt Ida. Uh, when I get together with my cousins, we try to reconstruct some of it, you know, and they remember things I don't remember and vice versa. Right. But I tend to remember more than they do because I was there more than they were. Right, and also you, well, yeah. Because my father was dead, he was a more active figure in my family than he was in their lives because they all had living fathers. Right. You know, but I guess in a lot of cultures, in a lot of places, if a man's daughter loses her husband, he tries to step in and do what does what he can for being the father to her children. I hate to cut Elizabeth Ellis off. Even the thought of doing it digitally, virtually, gives me the heebie-jeebies. No one should cut off Elizabeth Ellis. But this ends our first hour of a two-hour interview. Many heartfelt thanks to Elizabeth for giving me so much of her time and for being the first to take the plunge. I hope you, my listeners, enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Thanks to Ben Schultz, who provided the music. Ben is a fine songwriter. Look up his work. Creating this podcast is very much a labour of love and takes a large amount of time and no small resource to make and host. To keep this podcast going and to help create more, please consider making a donation. You can do this either through my website, www.simonbrooksstoryteller.com, or on my Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash simonbrooks. Subscribe, tune in, stay in touch. If you can, 
leave a review wherever you found this episode. It helps not just me, but it helps others find this podcast and know what they're getting into. Please jump on the interwebs and find out more about my guests and follow them, and me if you like. All the guests are amazing storytellers, which is why I interview them on this show. Again, thanks for listening and being there. Tune in next month, or maybe it'll be sooner, for the second part of the Elizabeth Ellis interview. Until next time, be out there. Thank you.